Welcome back to the Welsh History Podcast, episode 58, From Man to King. During our previous episodes, we talked about the rise of Gwyneth and the arrival of the noisy neighbor in Ireland. This week, I want to go further into that discussion and talk about the first king of the new dynasty, the man who commissioned Nennius, who created second and arguably greatest line of the Gwyneth monarchs, Murfin Fierich. When King Huel died in 825, there was no male heir who could take up the mantle of king, or at least that was the traditional view. It was suggested that the only true heir was a man from the maternal line related to Kinian through his mother. The Welsh kingship does not immediately disavow descendants' access to the crown by the maternal lines. In fact, it was a possibility. The evidence of this happening, though, was fairly scant. There may be rather important reasons why this route happened and why it was supported. So in 826, the second dynasty of Gwynedd ascended to the throne in the guise of Murfin ap Gwyrad, better known as Murfin the Freckled. The second big part of the story of Murfin was where he originally came from. In one case, the evidence is murky. A mention in a poem here, a genealogy there, and an Irish annal all point to one thing, that Murfin was not a native Welshman, but that he came from the island of Man. Academics have argued this point for a number of years, some arguing for Scottish origin, some for a Welsh one, others even for an Irish foundation. So why would people think Murfin came from elsewhere? Well, in one case, the links to the Old North, as Penetha, for example, was claimed to have come to Gwynedd from that area, from the Manau Gadothan, to be exact. It might be useful, at a time when the Old Kingdom came to an end, to claim that same ancient lineage. These convoluted claims go back to the Old North, and then do a complete transition into the Old Roman Imperial Pretender Maximus. Of course, as we know, a hero to a lot of the Welsh in the Middle Ages. This is not surprising, as a number of medieval genealogies have some pretty interesting claims. For example, just to name one that's close to home, my wife's genealogical line goes through kings who claim ancestry to people, such well-known figures as Thor, Odin, and others have claimed Jesus, and even pharaoh, Egyptian pharaohs, or any number of links. All of these being related to God makes it much easier to argue that you were divinely made king, that you are God incarnate in on earth a representative of his kingdom on earth. It also gives form to a kind of cover for those who may have grabbed the throne in ways that might be considered slightly shady, such as people like Murfin. The Welsh claim may have come due to the questions about being a foreigner and having one on the throne. Easier to justify someone who was born in Wales, no different really from modern ideas about leaders. Just look at the Constitution of the United States, which demands that only native-born people can run for president. Also, we talked earlier in this podcast series that Murfin may have needed a link to himself and ally himself to Arthur because the idea of an overlord by merit instead of by birth might have appealed to a dynastic head who does not have that legitimate link to the past. It is likely during this period that the Arthur myth became a fixed idea, that Geoffrey Monmouth made flesh. Other scholars argue that with the paucity of evidence, it's probably best just to leave the whole argument alone. But when you have a circumstances where there is no evidence at all, it's better to at least have something to work from. So, one other location that we haven't really talked about yet comes into view, however, and that's the Island of Man. It appears to be the most logical, though not necessarily the most solid. For one, some confusion exists as to the sources with the name of Man being with the island of Mon or Anglesey. This confusion comes from sources calling Rodri the Great as Rodri of Man, as in he came from there, when he was actually born in Wales and probably on the island of Mon. So it's rather 
difficult to understand why Rodri is called Rodri of Man instead of Rodri of Mon. However, historian Charles Edwards believes that there's enough evidence to lay the birthplace claim to man, naming infusion aside. He creates a compelling argument using sources which may explain the location for Murfin. First is the cross of Gurade in man. Transcribed in the 19th century, the cross mentions the figure of Gurade, who is both also mentioned possibly as the father of Murfin. The evidence is tangential as the naming in that area were a bit of a shell game as Celtic people rarely gave lots of detail which might help us identify the person, or lots of family links, or lots of information in general. Other writings from this period which uh, argue whether Huel was a king of Gwyneth or just related to Kinnan and was never the king. So there's a lot of debates there about what's going on, and a lot of arguments, obviously, from scholars because there's no clear definitive answer. The Welsh annals in particular are tersely brief in their explanations, and they make it incredibly difficult to actually be able to argue one way or the other, simply because they don't give us any information hardly at all to work from, and they get distracted by talking about stuff that doesn't have anything to do with Wales. Second example, though, is the verse in the margins of the Annals of Ulster, which mentions that Rodri Maurer was, as I said earlier, Rodri of Man. If this isn't the mistranslation that it could be, where it's really Rodri of Mon, then it might be a compelling example, not only that Murfin originated in Man, but that we might have a continued overlordship until the at least the end of Rodri's reign. Third circumstantial evidence comes from poets and genealogies written later to justify the reigns of later kings. However, with all this, there should be a note of caution. Professor Thornton, for example, writing on the subject, suggests that most of these arguments are made on very suspect documents that may not hold up. He cites at least two documents that might be influenced by current events, which dictated the way certain issues were discussed and why they were trying to argue for specific things, like the link to the Old North comes about later in the histories and genealogies, and appears to be more or less trying to show a link to the Gadothan in a period where they were more like a, a legend rather than reality. In effect, he suggests just as our earlier sources, Tacitus, B. Gillis, and Nennius, have biases working through them, which then influences their veracity, so too would these documents, and thus the idea that Murfin is any more than a Welsh usurper might be impossible to prove. And in fact, in some ways, the easiest explanation is that Murfin is simply a Welsh usurper who then, post his taking over, justifies it through a tangential link in his maternal line. But while we're talking a bit more about this, how about we go back in depth about what Charles Edwards was talking about and look more at this idea that Murfin was the king on the island of Man as opposed to just some usurper. Man avoided initially the Viking dominance of the 9th century, but at the same time it might have been influenced by the raiding going across all across the Irish Sea at this point. So it may have become a base of possible operations for the Vikings, or it may have also been the one outpost remaining of the British kings outside of Wales and Cornwall, and may have, at least up until they eventually are driven out at the end of the century, and we know this because Brythonic, which had some influence in the early developments of the Island of Man, ceases to be that, and we end up with Gaelic and Nordic being languages that have much more to do with the eventual naming conventions and all of those things that have to do with the way the island developed after that. The connection between Man and Anglesey would make sense when you look at the geographical locations. Man is just north of Wales, and is an easy stopover point to Northern Ireland and Southern Scotland, obviously in a period when coastal raiding was highly advanced and happening, and when you had trading that had been happening over centuries between all these different groups. And we know that there was exchanges of information and population between the North and the South, and they had to come from somewhere. They wouldn't Realistically, the fastest way to travel between the places is not to go through 
the land, but rather through the sea. So obviously it would make sense that we use your fast method to go back and forth, especially when you're sending messages, building alliances, sending people and things and slaves and goods to other places. You would take the sea, which is why the Vikings were so able to take advantage of all this and, and to control so much. So our evidence of the Vikings settling in man don't really show up until the 10th century. Up until then, they're more or less vacant from the archaeological record in the island. That doesn't mean we couldn't find something later that would show that they were there, but at the moment, that's all we really have. So because of that, there's a lot of suspicions that they didn't do what they did in the Orkneys and the Shetlands, where they had bases of operations until much later. And yet there may have been a port where they could stay, especially if they had influence over the island either through dominance of the local king or maybe an alliance that they had or any number of reasons that the Vikings and, and the Manx may have actually worked together to actually allow them to continue as kings. We do know at this point there isn't a lot of raiding in Wales until about 25 years later. So really, the Vikings haven't really hit Wales to this point. There isn't a lot of at least written or archaeological evidence so it's interesting to note, especially in Gwyneth, that they don't start hitting them until later. And so it does make one wonder if that's part of the reason. It could also be just the fact that, that there's so many other plump places to raid that raiding Anglesey and raiding the, the north coast of Wales didn't make a lot of sense to them. It's hard to say. Uh, this is at the same time that they're taking and creating Dublin and basically starting to control the entire east coast of Ireland, and slowly moving into England. Charles Edwards also suggests that it might be down to Murfin and Rodri maintaining the dominance over the area during this period, and it's only after Rodri has died that the Vikings are able to make a more permanent base there. Uh, Charles Edwards does not believe the suggestion that Murfin was driven out of man, because that's another one that's been offered, is that he was in man when... The Vikings came, they drove him out, and because they drove him out, it ended up creating a situation where he is able to take over this Welsh kingdom, which really, honestly, doesn't make a lot of sense if you think about it, because if you're a defeated monarch, you're not going to come in and suddenly take over. You would have had to have been there for quite some time, you know, I mean, plotting and switching over people to your point of view. And while he may have been a very strong king, it is difficult to overthrow a current sitting monarch when you yourself just lost your kingdom. So one would think that that is unlikely. Now, the other suggestion could be that it was a peaceful turnover, that he, he abandoned man because of the Vikings, uh, settling in Anglesey, and then eventually, as he had connections, that then would make him easily acceptable as the next king. Now, let's talk about what some of those connections may or may not be. Now, in his own genealogy, he claims through the maternal line, descendancy through the kings of Gwyneth, specifically of the of the Kanetha line, which has been so dominant up to this point, uh, through Kinnan as well. Now, there is an argument here about who this woman is. Is she his mother or possibly more likely his wife? And the reason why this comes up is because when looking at the history between these groups, there is some suggestion at one point that Kinnan is defeated in his battle with his brother, Huel, and then flees to man. And while there, basically is exiled. So there would be some connection there. So why would he have gone there if there wasn't? And would the connection be the fact that he was a relative of this person maybe he married his what his daughter off to this man and thus when he comes to murfin's land he is not just a exiled king but also a relative someone you're, you're willing to do something for so conversely if murfin is exiled from the vikings raids does he then become it by default step into that position of course, the problem with that is, is is there's no evidence that Huel did not have children and that he was childless and couldn't have had his own descendants take over. 
So it does feel like it's much more of a hostile takeover. As well, with all this is the discussions over Mercia and the Mercian dominance of Wales at this point in time. This is the end of Mercian dominance that we're talking about. In fact, as Murfin takes over is when the Mercians are finally defeated from the West Saxons and they lose a great deal of their control over Kent and over the areas on the east and by default lose control of Wales and become just another kingdom subservient eventually to the West Saxons or Wessex as it will eventually be called properly. This means that they may have had a hand in the Welsh kingdom of Gwynedd. Remember that we've talked all along that, that there was a point where Mercia and Gwynedd had alliances. And in fact, the previous couple of centuries, they've been working together to defeat Northumbria. And then once Northumbria fell and Mercia became the dominant partner, they started to enforce their will upon places like Gwynedd. So instead of being the, the ally, they're the dominant partner in the whole thing. And... So there is some suggestion by Charles Edwards that what we see is, is that as time is going on, when this debate between Kinnan and Huel is happening, and then it turns into this war, that the Mercians join the side of their ally, who is Kinnan, not Huel. And that would make some sense because they seem to get involved when Kinnan is fighting for his kingdom. And they appear to raid into Gwyneth when Huel is sitting on the throne. And yet don't do that when Kinnan's on the throne. Which, again, would show some sense of an alliance there. And it, and it does make you wonder, is was Gwyneth really allied with a lot of different kingdoms in the area at that point in time? And Huel was kind of an uprising against some of that? Was he trying to throw off the yoke of Mercia? You know, what was the reasoning behind that? We don't know, obviously, because the sources are incomplete about what was going on. But the reality is, is that this could be what was happening. And this debate over the kingship then brings Murfin into the discussion. And as Murfin enters the discussion, he then positions himself through marriage into having a link to the king. Now, of course, when Kinnan dies and then Huel dies, does Huel knock off his brother's children so as to leave him without an heir that way if he dies his his own children take over or was there a case of Kinnan's family went into exile or was Murfin at that point the senior family member was he the only male heir to the throne effectively for Kinnan's side so that while he's not a blood relative of Knatha necessarily, which if we look at this as Kinnan offering a not a daughter, but a sister to his father, to Murfin's father, and Murfin is actually the son of this woman, then all of a sudden that might change things again because that link between those two is a bit stronger. And so either way, the other part of this is he could have been accepted as a godson and brought into a role which then puts him in place as if he's a son. If Kinnan had no male heir, then that also could be the reason why we get to this point. Either way, it makes it interesting because from the patronymic line, he is not related to Kanatha. That much is very clear from everything that they've tried to say, from every information we have, and realistically from the way Murfin has propagandized what we know about him. I mean, the history of Britain that Ninius writes is from the Murfin perspective, and it is influenced by this concept that kings are not necessarily inheritable positions, that a great and well-experienced person who could be noble enough could take over, i.e. Arthur uh, and others that are mentioned. So in fact, I still suspect that that's the reason why Arthur becomes the example instead of a few of the others like uh, Ambrosius, who obviously was noble. You know, if Arthur's not nobility, then it makes way more sense why Murfin would push this agenda because he's trying to show this link to someone who by merit won this thing rather than by uh, 
uh, necessity of birth. And that would claim and show his claim quite clearly. So what we're seeing here is the rise of someone who's very important to the community becomes important to us in everything that happens past this point. So because of that, he gets justified so much more than anybody else, because now they need to explain why he's important. And so when you've got an ancestor that you're trying to big up, to put it bluntly, uh, you do things to try and point that out. And like I said earlier, you might make them a relative of God. You might, might do all these things, but either which way you have to show this, which is why I think they pushed the maternal line and this idea that he was a descendant of Kanatha, that great legendary figure who dominated Gwyneth. Until next time, everyone, thank you very much for listening. Thank you for uh, being with me through this. Thank you for all your kind words, your emails, your tweets, your retweets, you're suggesting to your friends to listen to the podcast. I really appreciate it. Um, just word of warning. I'm, I'm probably going to change up the format a little bit, not in the the format of the podcast itself, but rather how often it comes out. Uh, this is just due to several things just building up and building up and I'm just falling behind. So what I want to do is, is put us on a two weekly, a biweekly release schedule. So every two weeks on Friday, this will, this podcast will come out. That'll allow me to catch up over the next couple of weeks and try and get ahead of things. And as we go forward, I'll still be putting out episodes, but it'll be coming out every two weeks instead of every week. Uh, I please consider uh, becoming a supporter on Patreon, patreon.com forward slash Welsh history. That helps me get some of the books that I need to be able to do the research and, and give you as whole of this as I can and be as thorough as I can. And we know from the recent history of, of talking about Welsh history in, in current events, that this is more important than ever, that I get it right as much as possible. So any help you can give me would be awesome. I, I really appreciate it. And like I said, sharing, liking, off, letting people know is just as important. So please, please keep that up. Thank you so much. Thank you for listening. We'll talk to you later. You can reach me at Welsh history podcast at gmail.com on Twitter at Welsh history pod, or even come to my personal account, which is John J O N D M P on Twitter, or come to our Facebook page, which is facebook.com forward slash Welsh history podcast. Until next time, everybody take care. Bye-bye. Edge of the Abyss Creations is a proud sponsor of the Welsh history podcast. Your one-stop shop for unique jewelry, paintings, and other crafty creations. You can find us at facebook.com slash edge of the abyss one. This has been a Distractions Media production. For more info, you can check out everything we do at distractionsmedia.com.